Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Thank you so much, Martin and Mind the Product, for having me. Um, I think one of the things I really love about conferences like this is that they're by product managers, for product managers, and they're really about the discipline and the, and the joy that is product management. Um, so I'm here to talk about a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, I just want to very quickly give you a little bit in terms of background. Um, as Martin mentioned, I was at Uber. Uh, most recently running, I was the head of product there for about three and a half years. Um, so when I started there back in 2011, uh, we were 20 people. Uh, I think we just opened up uh, New York about a few months before I started, and we were in the process of opening up Seattle. And then towards the end of last year, um, hundreds of cities, uh, 2,000 plus employees, and today or yesterday, I guess, technically, Uber turned five. So happy birthday, Uber. Um, obviously, an amazing place to be and uh, just a really great ride. Um, so today I want to talk a little bit about something that I really got to practice a lot at Uber, and you know, I think that all of us get to practice every day in our jobs as product managers, and it's the art of saying no. So, <laughs> so as much as product is about um, you know, shipping and building products and launching great things into the world, Invariably, in order to launch some things, we have to not launch other things. And that's really a big part of what we do. There are times when I felt like all I was doing was saying no. And it can take an emotional toll on you, because you really don't want to say no to people. It's just hard. It's not fun. And so what I want to talk about is what are real world like tactics and strategies that we can use to move away from saying no, period, and having it be this really negative thing to getting to a place where we're actually having a conversation with people and we're maintaining those relationships and walking away from that, even if not feeling great about it, at least good about it. And that's really what I want to talk about today. So a little bit about why we say no, how to find common ground with the people that you're saying no to, and then also after that, thinking about what are some ways that we can actually find a solution to the problem. Because as product managers, that's ultimately what we're trying to do is solve problems that users and people have every day. So here's the word no in many, many different languages. And it's a fun exercise, actually, if you, uh, if you, just, if you just take a day and count how many times you say no in that day. You, I think you'll be surprised how often it happens. Um, and obviously, we say no a lot. We say no for different things. We say, no, um, I don't want fries with that. Or maybe we say yes to that. Um, we say things like, no, I, I don't want to donate, and I don't want to sign your petition. Or, no, I don't want to go on a date. And so these, these kinds of no's are are not fun, but they're not that hard, because they're, they're transactional no's, in the sense that we're saying no, and we're either going to give something for that or pay something for that service, and we're choosing not to, or in that we don't really want to maintain that relationship. So we're okay with walking away from that person and not really worrying too much about it later. But if you contrast that to saying no in real life to things like your parents, or to your significant others, or to your children, those no's are a lot harder to say, because we really care about these people. We have a relationship with them, and we want to continue and maintain that relationship, because we know that at some point in the future, we're going to need something from them. And so those are the kinds of no's in a professional environment that I really want to talk about today. And it happens in a lot of different contexts. I think um, it's particularly le relevant for product managers, because so much of what we do is to interface with many, many other groups. And as a result of it, we're sort of in the middle, and we know a little bit about all of the things that are happening, whereas people that are in a specific group and work in a specific discipline are really tend to be more focused on the things that are unique to them. And so the place that we're put into is like, oh, actually, you know, you want to do this thing, but then there are all these other things happening here. And so that puts in a unique position to really be able to offer the background behind why it is that we say no. Um, so, why we say no? There's one really big reason why all of us have to say no in the workplace on a pretty regular basis, right? And fundamentally, it comes down to one word, which is prioritization. So if we had infinite resources and we had infinite time, we could say no. We'd say yes all the time. We wouldn't have to say no. It just wouldn't be necessary, right? But the reality is that we don't. And there's this great proverb that I have, which is, if you chase two rabbits, you will lose them both. And depending on if you Google this up, like, there's still, it might be Russian, it might be Polish, it might be Native American, some people say it's Confucius, but wherever the actual source of it is, the, the, the result of it is true. It's about focus, right? And prioritization, I think can sometimes feel like a really bad thing, but it's not. It's really necessary and it's really good. And for me, one of the most important things about prioritization is that 
you have to be able to articulate what it is that you're doing and why you're doing it. And I always find that when I'm forced to explain myself, whether it's in, in speaking it or whether it's writing it out, I'm actually much better able to believe in what it is that I'm doing and why I'm doing it. So one activity that I always like to do is walking out of a um, prioritization session is actually just to take a little bit of time by myself and put up the prioritization list, like the things that we decided to do, and then the backlog, which is the things that we didn't decide to do side by side. And work my way through that backlog and say, OK, well, hold on. Why is this on the backlog list as opposed to in the priority list? And if I can sort of take my way and prove that on each of the things, then I feel really confident that I know we've made the right choices. And when somebody else comes along, because invariably it's going to happen, it's like, well, why aren't you doing that thing? I have an answer for it. Now, backlogs, of course, I'm not talking about like 100 list long backlogs. You've got to prioritize the backlog, too. But really, those top sort of five or 10 things where you were debating it and you were trying to figure out how it was that it actually worked, and then it just didn't quite make it on there. And what happens with this, actually, um, is that several things happen. For me, the example that always comes to mind is that um, we were at Uber at one point. We were figuring out, OK, a, a bunch of different things. And I saw, I saw one thing, actually, it was on our priority list, not on our backlog list. And it was about building a uh, SQL, um, building a SQL uh, user interface. So we didn't really have great dashboards. We didn't have the best analytic solutions. What we did do, though, is like teach every single person how to use SQL and give them at database access. So that meant like tons and tons of people are writing these SQL queries. They really feel powerful. They have all of this ability to do it. But they have to use this like old, crappy interface in order to be able to get there. So we built, we decided, OK, well, we're going to build a SQL interface that people can use. And I was looking at this on the priority list thinking, wait, what? Why are we doing that? There's ways to solve this problem. People already have access to it. And so what I ended up having to do is actually, I just I couldn't prove it. I couldn't argue and relate why this thing was on the priority list, as opposed to stuff that we had on the backlog that was really important. And so I actually like, had to go and find our like, head of analytics and sit down and really go through it with him and ask, why are we doing this? What's going on here? And as a result of that, like, I really had a strong understanding of like, here's how many queries people are running a day. Here's the load on the database. Here's what's happening at all times of the hour. And I, don't, I think if I hadn't really gone through that exercise, there's just no way that I would have been able to explain it. And also, as a PM on it, I don't think I would have been in a good position to really defend it and be able to explain why it was that it was important that we were doing that. So that's why I think this, this forcing yourselves to really articulate value and, and talk about why is it that we're doing this thing is incredibly important from the standpoint of being able to come to things with the with being able to answer the question of you know why can't I have this? So there's lots of different ways to prioritize, and I think that you know a really common thing that I see people doing, and I'm, I'm guilty of it myself, is you put a whole bunch of things on a list, you stack rank the list based on how hard it is to do things and how many people you have and whether or not they can do it, and then you draw a line and you say okay cool these are all the things that we're going to do. And then a few hours later, you're talking to somebody. They come by, and they say, hey, can you do this thing for me? So you look at it. You sort of think about how hard it is. It's not too bad. You're like, OK, cool. Well, I got a little bit of buffer time. Let me, let me put it on their list. Then another person comes along a few hours later, and they say the same thing. And you're like, OK, well, I still have a little bit of buffer time. Let me put it on. And then the third person comes along, and you realize you're on this slippery slope. And the only response you can give to this third person now who comes along and tells you that they need this thing and shows you why it's important to them and why it matters is to say, ah, too bad. If you'd just come to me a few hours ago, and that's definitely not the position you ever want to find yourself in. It just makes you look bad, and it makes you feel bad, and it makes the other person feel bad. There's nothing you can do but say no, period. And that is the last thing in the world that you really want to be able to do. So we want to move away from prioritizing by effort alone. And I think alone is an important word here, because effort does matter. It's not that you can just think about, like, OK, what, what is it? You have to consider effort in the scope of everything else. And that's why I think when it comes to priorities, what you really need are these four things. Goals, success metrics, timeframes, and potential solutions. So timeframes can be, you know, you're, you're defining priorities at different levels of granularity. It might be a super high level. It might be, like, lower than that. Like, I think Google does an amazing job of this with OKRs, right? When we were at Google, we had, like, company-level OKRs. We had department-wide OKRs. You could have your own OKRs. You had product OKRs. So everybody has a sense of what it is they're doing, but they all have to follow this specific template of why am I trying to do this? What is my goal? My success metric, how am I going to prove that I've actually achieved this goal? 
how much time do I have in order to be able to do it? And time frames can be arbitrary, but in my experience, I found that generally setting sort of like product level goals, three months or a quarter is a really good way to think about it. It's enough time to be able to do stuff. You can set sort of like monthly check-ins and then, but you're not thinking too far ahead. You can generally plan for what you think is going to happen over the next quarter. And then two weeks is a great sort of time frame for like sprint planning or things like that. And then you can have potential solutions. So one uh, major goal at Uber on a, on a pretty regular basis was supply growth. It was like the goal was there are consumers that can't get rides. They can't get cars. Why is it that they can't do that? We need to be able to solve that problem. So we want to get to the point where every single rider can get a driver whenever they want to. That's our goal. Success metric. We're going to look at the actual like, conversion request. So if somebody tries to request a ride, what percent of those requests actually completed and went to a full ride? How many of them were canceled? How many of them couldn't be fulfilled? Um, what, what are the issues that happened there? And we're going to do this in three months. And there's a whole bunch of ways we could do this. One is that we could just stop accepting users, of course, because then we keep the demand the same and supply continues to grow. Probably not a great idea. We could work on expanding our supply itself. We can try and get more people in the pipeline. We can grow the pipeline, come up with better driver recruiting solutions, get drivers through the onboarding funnel faster. Or we could also try this innovative new concept called surge pricing, where prices demand fluctuate depending on, the, on supply and demand. And so there's many different ways to solve a problem, but ultimately where it comes down to is that you want to focus on why you're solving the problem, why it matters, and then how you're actually going to measure your ability to get there. So once you have that in place, you know what your priorities are, you know what your goals are, you know why you're doing it, this is when you're having the conversation with that person who says, hey, can you do this thing for me? You want to find common ground. And so what that means is really just finding agreement on the company goals. Now, sometimes people ask me, like, oh, does it matter who you're talking to? Like, what if you're, you're talking to people at different levels? So, like, the returns associate at ModCloth that's in the fulfillment center versus the head of marketing. And I actually think it doesn't matter. Because the point is that, as a PM, we need to have respect for every single person who we're working with. And it doesn't matter what that person's level in the company is. It doesn't matter what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. It doesn't even matter what our personal relationship with them is. The point is that we're all together in that company. We're employees. And we are trying to find a way to make this company the best that it can be. Now, the way in which we do it, how we do it, the specific things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, those might be different. But fundamentally, it doesn't matter who we are we're here to make the company better. And so that means we need to have agreement on what the company's goals are and why those are the company's goals. Because you can imagine trying to have a conversation with somebody who thinks that the most important thing you should be doing is getting lots and lots of new users in the door. As you have a conversation with a company CEO, all you're talking about is how to get deeper engagement with your users. And so if that conversation doesn't really happen at the beginning, there's no way that you're ever going to be able to get to a point where you can have this conversation and not say no, period, but really come away with a solution from that. So that, I think, is really the first step in having this conversation with somebody. Now, this is something that I have to remind myself of all the time, <laughs> which is that you just can't listen too much. And not that I love to hear this out of my own voice by any means, but you know, you get passionate about a product or something, and you just start talking about it, and you're excited, and you just keep going there, and you forget to listen. And sometimes people just need to be heard. You know, part of being a PM sometimes is being a therapist, and that's kind of what we do, and that's okay. And so I, I thought this cartoon was just really funny because it's like, you know, here's a relationship, here's a, a, a marriage, right? And it's like, it's clearly there's something off here, and it's not quite working, right? Can you listen to, can you repeat everything you said since we've been married? And so I just, I can't, I can't emphasize how important it is to just be quiet and to listen and to take in what people are saying whoever that person is, whenever you're having that conversation, because it's never, it's never a waste of time. And I know, like, in my mind, too, I've sort of been at that place where I'm like, oh, I've got, like, 500 emails to do. I've got that strategic roadmap review with that person tomorrow. Oh, I've got to write up that requirements document. I've got to review those designs and QA it. And all this stuff comes into our head, and we're not really listening. So what I find actually is very helpful for me in having these conversations is I actually put my, I put my laptop away, and I actually take out my notebook, and I start writing things down. And as soon as I'm forced to sort of transcribe and write those things down, I find that I'm listening much, much better. Because there's just not like, it's not like the Twitter and Slack notifications are off on the side. There's no like pings on emails, like nothing's happening. There's this great XKCD cartoon. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen it, but it's basically trying to reimagine what the world would be like if we had to do it on typewriters. And so you see this guy like typing D and ma, and it, before he can get to the M, he types in www.facebook.com. And so like <laughs> that, 
feel like sometimes when I have my computer on, and so that's why it's so great to just put it away and kind of go from there. So then what you want to be able to do after that is you want to listen, but you also want to be able to give back to this person. You want, to, you want them to have a deeper and greater understanding of what's going on at the company and what people are doing. And so I think one way that... Can you guys hear me? Okay. All right. Cool. Um, is actually to just think about what the solution is and what it involves. So it's okay to just sort of say like, all right, well, if we were going to do it, how would we actually go about doing it? Um, and what this does is a couple of things. One is that it actually makes sure that you really know what all the components are of all of the systems that are involved and that you actually understand as a PM like how to make something work. So. Um, one, the example I'm thinking of right now is, um, this is like Uber, right? back in 2012 or something. So we, we only had like maybe 10 or 15 cities at this point. And one of the things that somebody really wanted to do, it's a, a general manager in one of our cities, and a great idea, he said, well, I really want to be able to benchmark. I want to know how, my, how good I am relative to other people. So can you just give me a way to like be able to pull up my charts and also just add a benchmark feature, just pick a city so that I can go through and kind of do what I need to do there. So we sat down and we thought about this, like, okay, well, well, what if the city is in a different time zone then? How, how, should we show, how should we show these graphs? Should we pick something that is like, should we move everything to one time zone? Which time zone should we pick? Should we move it to a relative, to like a neutral time zone? Should we do it relative to like a zero point? What is it that you actually want us to do? So we went through that. And we, then it was like, okay, well, what if the numbers are really different? What, what should we do with the axes? Should we grow the charts so that the axis can grow? Like, how, how is that gonna work? Should we save it? What if you want to like change it to benchmark? Can you benchmark more than one thing? And you, you guys know how this conversation goes, right? So as soon as you start to do that, and just and do it in a way that's it's not condescending. It's not. It should never be about that. But it should be about understanding, and it should be about getting people to think about all of the things that play into this stuff. So that the next time when somebody says, "I hey, I've got this great feature," you know, they might actually have a better sense of like how all of the parts of the system play together, and they can have that. And then once you have that conversation about what the actual solution is, you can tie it back to goals. You can tie it back to like that, that time where you found your company agreement and what you wanted to do there and see whether or not it actually is part of those goals and how it's going to go. And then I think a great place in this template is to actually have resource allocation, right? Like the, we, we, have, we prioritize because we don't have enough people and we don't have enough time. So let's show you what everybody's working on. And we try to do our best, I think, at every company that I've worked at, to be really communicative with our roadmap, with, to everybody in the company, to the stakeholders. But you know, no matter how hard you try, you're going to miss it. And sometimes things will happen. You'll update the roadmap, but you won't update the roadmap that everybody else gets to see. And they won't actually have access to all of those things. And so as much as you can do to just keep communicating to people, here's what we're working on. Here's why we're working on it. This is what people are doing. You know, the better you're going to be, in, the better place you're going to be in to ultimately have these kinds of conversations. And really fundamentally, what you want to be able to do is find the intersection of your goals. Because we're all employees at the same company. We want to make the company better. So that means that there's got to be a way that we can figure out how my personal goal and your personal goal and our product's goal can all align with the company's goals. And that's really where, th that's the first part of it. Without finding that common ground, there's just nothing else that you can do. The conversation doesn't go anywhere. Once you're on the same plane, then there's something you can actually move on from and be able to do. So, all right, we've established common ground, we've figured out what it is that we're trying to do, we've talked about the solution, we've talked about how hard it's gonna be, what it involves, and all of that, and now we're in a place where we can actually find a way to make things happen. So this is all about moving away from no period to a solving a problem, right? And there's a bunch of different things we can do there, but the first and foremost, I think, is understanding the problem. So just as we were talking earlier about listening to people and hearing and thinking about what they're doing, sometimes we don't always know what they're trying to do, right? So I think most of us probably heard this like Henry Ford quote, which is if I really ask people what they wanted, they just tell me I wanted a faster horse. And so they wouldn't, if you ask them what the problem was, or if you ask them what the problem was, they'd say I want to get from point A to point B faster. And I've definitely made this mistake where I was, like, assumed that I knew what people were doing. Because people don't generally come to you with, with problems. They come to you with solutions, right? And so you want to move away from the solutions to actually getting to the problems and figuring out what those problems are. So a good, um, good example here is 
we had built this feature or this product at Uber. It was called, um, it was like a shared inbox, basically to help operations and logistics managers better be able to communicate with drivers. And we set this up in a way that was kind of like a ticketing system. So once somebody responded, like there was sort of a shared inbox in that all of, the, all of the messages would come in from drivers right early on in the beginning. And then when somebody, and it was up for grabs, so anybody looking at this could pick it up and start to respond to it. But once you responded to it, it came out of the up for grabs and sort of went into your own personal inbox that you didn't have access to anymore. And we, and we did this because we thought, well, you know, once somebody's already replied to it, we don't want to keep sharing the work. Like somebody's already decided that they're going to pick it up. It's just a task. So we'll let them take care of it. We won't show it to anyone else. And so we did this and we were like, of course, that makes sense. That's how it goes. And then we would start getting these requests in, which is like, hey, can I see what everyone's working on? And we just couldn't figure out, like, show it, show, it, show it to us all the time. We just couldn't figure out why it was that people were trying to do that. And so we, we had to talk to a bunch of different people. And ultimately, what we figured out is it was a process thing where generally the, the teams that found the most use for this were teams that had several different managers that were actually responding to and uh, responsible for communicating with drivers. So what would happen is that they would do it on a rotational basis. So like one person would do it on Monday, one person would do it on Tuesday, one person would do it on Wednesday. And what happens as a result is that like somebody would reply to it on Monday, but they'd get distracted or go off and do something else and need to work on something more urgent, and then they wouldn't pick it up, and they'd have to come back to it only when it was their turn again. So what that meant then is that the driver was just like, what's going on here? Like, I wrote in and nobody responded to it. And so what they were trying to do essentially is find a way to like, because they had this process system in place, is be able to change the product to sort of reflect the process. So we had to work through a couple of different things, but fundamentally, that's what we need to figure out. It wasn't that they actually wanted to be able to like, you know, share the work that way. It was just that they wanted to be able to respond to drivers faster and figure out a way to make it work within their process and how to do that. And I mean, we honestly, if we like, we, we talked to them, we, we talked to all of these people, like we, they, we had our stakeholders, we had our like weekly meetings and our, our updates and our betas. And we we're like, why didn't we ever figure this out before? And it just happens. It happens sometimes. And that's okay. But the key thing is to go in with that kind of mindset, I think, to have a problem-focused mindset as opposed to a solution-focused mindset. So um, in the last sort of part of what we have here, what I wanted to do is just spend a little bit of time talking about real strategies that we can use to actually figure out how to move away, how to make this a really productive and good conversation, right? And I've broken this out into sort of two large ways. There's features. And so those quick conversations of like, hey, can you just add this one little thing in? And then there's products, which are like larger, bigger things that you generally have to think about. Oh my, it's a, it's a, it's a, change, a real change to the roadmap. And, and typically what I've found, in my experience anyway, is that you know, features tend to come from people who are actually sort of more on the individual contributor level, like actually doing these things day to day. And these product questions tend to come mostly from like heads of departments or people who are managers that are actually responsible from like a larger standpoint. So there's also a difference in the way in which you the way in which you communicate these type of things and how and what your options are for how you go through that. So, um, so the first one I have here is, is a, add the feature in an upcoming version. And this is sometimes people just want to know that it's coming. And if they know like, hey, it's going to come out on this date and it's going to be available for that, that gets you a, a big part of the way because they know that you're working on something that's ultimately going to solve their problem. So one potential area for concern here, of course, though, is that, you know, oh, it's going to come out in V2 and then you never get around to V2, right? <laughs> or all of your scope for V2 changes and then it doesn't go there. So I think it's a great way to be able to say that this feature is gonna come up in an upcoming version, but just be honest, stick to it, you know, and if things change, make sure you communicate that back and that you can, you can stand behind that promise because that's what you're doing. Is if you wanna treat people with respect and you want them to know that you're really out there to try and solve their problem, when you show them that you have something that's, gonna, that's a solution, you have to stand behind it and make sure that you can actually do that. Um, the other thing, too, is you could use a combination of existing tools, right? So um, one, one thing that happened here is we used to have, um, when we first started out at Uber, we didn't necessarily have a ton of drivers. It wasn't super well known. So we, weren't, we didn't just come into a city and have like hundreds of drivers just turn on their phones all of a sudden. We actually had to start out, especially when we only had our black car model, by um, going up and like cold calling uh, drivers like car companies and saying like, hey, can we pay you to be online during this time? And then we had to actually pay them. So we had to figure out two things. One is like, we had to think about our take. So like, here's how much the fare cost, we take all of that. But regardless of that, we actually still have to pay drivers at a fixed hourly rate. And so we have to manage that and control it. 
But the thing is, we knew always that we weren't going to keep this model forever. We had to do it because it was the only way to be able to manage that at the beginning, to make sure that we had the supply we needed to be able to get that demand on the road. But fundamentally, it wasn't something that we wanted to continue supporting or building major products for because the whole goal was to get rid of it entirely, right? And so as a result of doing that, what we, what we ended up doing is the hard part is like, these guys would have to sit down, the, the operations teams would have to sit down and come up with tons and tons of spreadsheets and like literally spend an entire day trying to figure out how much drivers need to be paid, when they were online, how much they made. And so we couldn't, we couldn't build an entire like, product just to solve this problem. It didn't make sense, given our resources. But what we did do is we invested a little bit of time in thinking about, all right, well, the thing here is that you don't necessarily know how to pull the data. So let's write some SQL queries for you that will automatically pull the data and put it into a format that you can then just take and put directly into Excel. So great, now you've got that. Now it's just like a one-click thing as opposed to having to run multiple um, SQL queries to be able to get at the data and then transform it and manipulate it and put it into what you're doing. And writing a SQL query and setting it to run on a regular basis and sending an email that's really not that hard. We can do that. We can do that with our technology without spending a ton of time on it and still save you hours of work. And then the next thing was basically, here's where the, the ops team came in, because these guys are just like amazing Excel wizards. So a couple of the ops guys then created like macros to be able to run on the Excel sheet and transform it again into what it was that they needed. So it wasn't even sort of technology work that we had to do on our side, it was the team sort of coming together. And so through that combination of tools, they actually solved a huge part of the problem. So now, instead of spending an entire day trying to figure out how much to pay people, you could do this in like several hours, basically. And so that was really like an important piece of it. And then related to that, I think, is automated email reports. So a lot of times, like, building good analytics is hard. I don't know about you guys, but I still haven't found a great analytics solution. I mean, like, there's a lot of great companies out there that try to do good stuff, and I really believe in them, but I still haven't found something that solves the problem from top to bottom. And so all, as a result, you know, I think a lot of people still run SQL queries or whatever it happens to be to be able to get at data and do stuff with it. And so you have to remember, like what I used to do is I have to set like calendar reminders and like, okay, 9 a.m. every day, go run this SQL query and then pull it out and do that. Whereas if I just got an automated email report, honestly, like that's all, just run the SQL query, send it to me. And that's really not that hard to do, you know, set up a cron job. It's a very simple thing to do. And that in itself just changes the ways th that people respond to you. Because if you can do simple things, like even if they're, if, the, if people aren't necessarily super familiar with these simple things, like you've just solved a big problem for them and you didn't have to work very hard to do it. And it doesn't matter how much work you put in, what matters is did you solve the problem? And that's just the really important piece of it. So let's features. Here's products, right? So these are, these are bigger, and these tend to be at a managerial level that you have these conversations. They're a little bit harder to solve. So the first one is reduce scope, right? Turn it into a feature. Maybe it doesn't have to be some giant product. And if you do that, well, then you already have a bunch of solutions and strategies to be able to do that. Research and circle back. I think this is a really important one, too, because sometimes you need to say, I don't know. I don't have enough information. I don't really know where we can go with this. And Part, if you've listened to them, if you've understood the problem and you know where they're trying to go, then being able to say, like, let me get back to you is an unbelievably important thing here. And, like, people really respect it. So I think it's, it's really important to go out and do that. And then the last thing is to escalate. Another word that I think people can sometimes think of as negative. And escalation can be bad. It can be bad if you just use it kind of without really thinking about it, right? If you're just like, oh, God, I don't want to deal with this person. Let me go tell my manager. That's probably not a good way to escalate. But if you have a serious conversation with somebody and you really sit down and try to figure out how it is that you're going through things, you cannot find agreement on company goals. You fundamentally believe that what you need to do is re-engage users and this person fundamentally believes that what you need to do is acquire new users. Well, hey, this is a time sometimes that you need to call people in. And you know, if you happen to be the most senior person at the company, well, then you get to like, you know, Put, right, put your hand face down and say like, well, no, that's what we're gonna do. But if you're not, <laughs> then you have somebody else that you can bring in to help you with that. And again, the goal isn't, it's not about proving people right or proving people wrong. It's really about solving problems. It's about finding a way to get to the goal and help people do the jobs that they're trying to do so that they can all help the company grow and kind of be a better place. And you know, it's not always building a product. It's not always about getting your engineers together, getting your designers together, and having them do that. Sometimes it's really just about connecting people. So it was one one example I'm thinking of is we would have all of these like interesting events that can community managers around the world would do at Uber, and 
we just get all these like requests flooding in and we'd be able to do some, we wouldn't be able to do others. And the problem was people just weren't talking to one another. And so the simplest thing to start with really was, hey, we just set up like a, a weekly meeting where all the community managers in the world like got together and they spent time just quickly thinking about it. We put together a spreadsheet where people could just input all of the different things that they wanted to run and when they wanted to run it. And we could say whether or not we could do it or not, we could monitor status around it. No products, no engineering, nothing involved here. It's just a way of organizing and getting people together. So a big part of this is being creative, finding new solutions, and really thinking about what is the problem? What is somebody trying to solve? How can we help them do it? Um, and so, you know, you've probably forgotten everything I said already. That's okay, I do too. But I just wanted to say that there's, I think there's really three things here. If you forget everything else that I've said, these are the three things that, you know, I think you can write on post-it notes and take away and still find useful. The first and most important thing is articulating priorities. We have to be able to prove to ourselves that what we're doing is, what, is important, that we need to do it, that we have to be able to defend it to our dying breath. We have to be able to find common ground in goals, to work with people to make sure that our, our, we're, we're on the same page, that we're all here to make the company better, that we're all here to solve what we're trying to do, hit our vision and make that happen. And the last thing, I think, is to be creative and consider alternate solutions. It's not always about building a product. It's not always about applying engineering or technology to solve a problem. Sometimes it's just about figuring out how to get people talking. So that is all I have to say. Thank you so much. Um, and I hope that you know, you'll have what you need to be able to move away from no period to really solving problems. Thanks.